Hello, how's everybody doing? Woohoo! I've got uh, five o'clock by my watch, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Those that aren't here can uh, catch up as we go. So just real quick, it's kind of hard to see with the bright light, but how many people out here actively own a scanner that they listen to stuff in their area? Good. Woohoo! That's right. So we're going to talk a little bit about scanning and listening to different radio systems and talk about some of the changes that are coming up uh, in some of the different systems and how there's some different trends that are happening and uh, what it's going to take to be able to listen to these systems long term and uh, uh, kind of identify how some of the systems lay out and work. Since there is a, kind of a mixed audience here, I'll have uh, just some basic overview at the beginning. I'll go real quick, I promise, uh, and then we'll kind of progress from there and uh, go through the next uh, 50 minutes or so and uh, try to show you guys some neat stuff. So at the very beginning, we start off with the very basics of radio. So we have different types of frequencies that are out there that people can use and different methodologies for using those frequencies. The very basic is what's called simplex, which is when there's two radios and they use the exact same frequency, they transmit back and forth and talk to each other. So that means one user, one frequency, or actually the same people that are on the same frequency talking, so it could be two users. Uh, but then they can talk all using that one frequency. That's called simplex. The challenge with that is, is then everybody has to have their own frequency and that then you start to run out of frequencies because there's only so many of them out there. Then you start interfacing with tones. There's two different types of zone, tones, CTCSS and also DCS. CTCSS is Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System and uh, otherwise known as PL or private line depending on which uh, flavor you're using. What that is is a sub-audible tone that actually rides with your audio carrier and if you are trying to talk to another radio, if that radio doesn't hear the tone, the squelch never opens up and so you don't ever hear the audio. So now I can be sending a tone of one, two, three and if you're listening for a tone of four, five, six, you'll never hear me talk. That means that we can all be on the same frequency and start talking and I can have a conversation up here with Taylor and you guys can have a conversation with somebody else and we'll never hear each other, but we're all on that same frequency. Obviously, there's some interference challenges there uh, that as you continue to add more and more people, it gets a little bit more uh, challenging uh, to say with that having multiple people on there. Uh, next is digital coded squelch system. That's a kind of a newer style of the subaudible tone. Uh, instead of a subaudible tone, it's actually a digital code that's sent along with your audio. Same thing, the receiver has to hear that digital code or it doesn't open up the squelch and people don't hear it. So the problem with simplex and tones and all that is you don't have enough coverage. When you're in like a building like the Riviera here and if you want to have coverage down to the other end of the strip, um, that simplex frequency just isn't going to work. Some people will probably use CBs or FRS radios or something like that and they just can't get the distance out of them. That's because it's all simplex, point to point, uh, one radio to one radio. So you introduce a repeater. A repeater uses two different frequencies, one for the input and one for the output. So that means I transmit on one while you're listening on the other. All I have to do is make it to the repeater. The repeater then sends out with a lot of power a really strong signal to get to the other side. So it really extends the coverage uh, and that's the real use for repeaters. So that's the end of the basics. I'll get into the good stuff now. Um, so if you want to listen to stuff, back in the day it was really simple. Everything was what we would call conventional or traditional or simplex or however you want to refer to it. And it was just simply dialing in a frequency. Uh, we hail out of Utah and uh, our systems there are... Uh, uh, VHF based, I should say were VHF based, so if we wanted to listen to the Highway Patrol out of Salt Lake City, we'd simply tune a radio to 154905 and we could listen to the Highway Patrol. We have a statewide frequency there for law enforcement, which is where they would do all the high speed chases and that kind of stuff, and you would simply tune to 155505. Made it really simple, really easy. You could buy any scanner, you could buy any ham radio, punch in these frequencies and you were good to go. There wasn't a lot of complexity to it. If you had a tone, you could turn a tone on and then only hear that specific uh, person or if you didn't have tones you would just hear everybody on that frequency. Um, but nowadays it's gotten a little bit more complex. Um, not that trunked radio is a new technology, it's actually quite old, it's been around for a long time, but there's a lot more people switching over to it and a lot of agencies are making moves to it, uh, specifically in Utah uh, as well. There's a large contingency of people moving to it, but we see that across the board. Along with trunked systems now we're introducing digital technology and encryption. Encryption's been around for a while, but again it's getting more and more used. And we'll talk a little bit more about both of those as we progress. So what exactly is trunked radio? Well, I talked about having users 
sharing a frequency. So the Highway Patrol was on 154905, right? So that means all the Highway Patrol guys are running around with that frequency programmed in their radio. And that means somebody else is on another frequency. So everybody's organized by frequency. What happens in a trunk system is everybody's sharing a group of frequencies. So if I have five agencies under the old model, I had to have five frequencies. Where now if I have, let's say, 20 agencies, I could have those 20 agencies sharing five frequencies. And all those agencies are grouped by what's called talk groups. So talk groups are little clubs of people or little organizations, if you will, that are identified by a number on the radio system. So what happens is when that, uh, that radio keys up, it tells all the other radios out there, it says, hey, everybody in my group, let's go over here so we can talk real quick. So it's just like this room. We've got a whole bunch of people in here. We're all sharing the same room, but we could organize out by state of who goes where and all of a sudden group up into these little groups. That's kind of like what talk groups would be. You would group up with people that are of a similar service or a similar function in that specific area. Radios then monitor a central control channel. This is one frequency that is, uh, is controlled, and that's where all the, the noise and data is sent out from the, tr uh, the, the radio system that controls who's doing what and what frequencies they're on. What that does is when somebody keys their radio, it sends a little data bit up to the control channel and says, hey, I want to talk to everybody in my talk group. Then all of a sudden, it sends out a data burst to everybody and says, I need everybody to switch to frequency 5, let's say. And then all those radios will switch over to frequency 5. They'll hear their traffic. When somebody unkeys after they're done talking, everybody goes back to the control channel and waits for further assignment. So sometimes they'll stay on that frequency for a little while. Otherwise, they'll just come back to the control channel. And what that allows you to do is with like five frequencies, for example, you can have multiple agencies running. You could have different police channels. You could have different fire channels. You could have tow trucks. You could have uh, taxi cabs. All that can share the exact same five frequencies, and they just bounce from within the, uh, the, control, uh, the control of the trunk system. There are three main system types of trunked radio systems. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them out there, but there are three main types, and, and particularly three that we can monitor very easily. Um, they are Ericsson, EF Johnson, and Motorola. Ericsson, uh, their most popular system there is, is the EDAC system. It's uh, the Enhanced Digital Access Control System. Uh, EF Johnson is LTR, which is the Logical Trunked Radio System. And then Motorola, there's uh, SmartNet and SmartZone, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about it. Motorola is probably the most popular. Um, I know they're the most popular in, in the Utah area, um, and I would imagine through your different areas, the Motorola systems are probably the most popular popular ones that you guys end up seeing out there. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about how those work. So real quick, let's go into a high level overview of how Ericsson and, and uh, EDAX and uh, the LTR systems work. So the EDAX systems are pretty straightforward. It's kind of like what I just explained. Everybody monitors a central control channel. When somebody keys up, they all jump off to a frequency. And when they're done, they all jump back to that central control frequency. Each frequency is assigned an LCN, or a logical channel number. So the control channel tells the radio what LCN to go to. It doesn't say go to 854.6000. It says go to LCN3. And then the radios all jump to LCN3. What that means to scanner users is you have to program the frequencies for an EDAC system in LCN order. If you don't program them in that order, your scanner's not going to know where to jump to. So when someone keys up, that control channel says, oh, jump to LCN4, you're going to jump to what is really LCN5 or 2 or whatever because you've got them programmed in the wrong order. So it's very key that you get the LCN numbers correct when programming up an EDAC system. Um, the controller tells all the radios to switch, uh, and then they jump back. So frequencies must be entered in LCN order uh, to, uh, to be able to scan that or listen to it if you have an actual uh, EDAX radio. EF Johnson, Logical Trunk Radio. This is what the Riviera Hotel uses here on their premises for security and housekeeping and everything. Uh, they use an LTR system. It's a little bit different. It's a decentralized model. So it doesn't use a traditional control channel that sits on one frequency. It uses a series of control channels that are all sub-audible. So on every frequency across the system, uh, the sub-audible data is sent. So there's not a waste of a frequency for a control channel. So let's say you had five control ch or excuse me, five frequencies on your trunk system. The control channel, if you are using a traditional system, one of those frequencies is going to be the control channel. That means you've got four more frequencies to be able to use. In an LTR system, you can actually use all five because the, the trunk data is uh, residing on all five frequencies simultaneously. It uses subaudible data to be able to, uh, to send that out, and then all the radios listen on their assigned, uh, their assigned channel. It uses LCNs as well. The difference here is people don't centrally locate to one, uh, one uh, control channel. They listen 
on whatever one they're assigned to, and they will stay on that channel um, unless somebody else is busy, or if that frequency is busy, then they'll be forced to jump. So for example, the primary frequency here at the hotel, um, everybody will stay on that frequency, and they won't move unless, they, uh, unless somebody else is talking on that frequency, then they'll jump off to one of the other ones. Which what that means is if you have just a ham radio that's non-trunking, and you know that primary frequency, you can just punch that in and listen to it, and you're going to pick up a good portion of the traffic. Unless there's a lot of other users and other traffic going on, then you're not going to be able to hear that. You'll start getting real confused because one person's going to talk from one group, and somebody else is going to talk in another group, and you're never going to hear the response, and the two conversations are going to really get confusing really quite fast. So, um, But it's kind of fun to listen to some of the stuff going on here in the hotel, especially when this conference is in, in the area. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good stuff. If you haven't listened, you should tune in. It's, it's good stuff. So Motorola, this is where uh, the majority of the stuff is. This is where the, the meat and potatoes are. This is where uh, a lot of changes are coming. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those challenges in that that have been, uh, been on the horizon. The basic Motorola system is what's called a SmartNet system, and it sits all within a site. You have a single transmitter in the middle, and uh, it's kind of maybe hard to see the colors there. I've got two different people there. I've got a black talk group and a red talk group, and the single transmitter in the, meter, in the middle is radiating both of those different talk groups, so it's radiating both black and red. So these black and red users can travel anywhere around in that site and pick up their information. They're not really communicating back to that site or anything. They're just kind of there, and they're just picking up what's going on. Same thing with a scanner user. If the scanner user is in this circle, they can be able to pick up either the red or the black talk group without any problems whatsoever. That's called a smart, smart net site. Um, with that, there are um, 28 channels that are available within a, uh, a single site. So if you have a site like this, you can have up to 28 frequencies within that, and that allows you up to 60,000 uh, radio IDs. So you can have a lot of users within a given site like that. The next problem that you might run into is if you only have a single site and a single transmitter, you might have coverage issues. So let's say we stick a transmitter here on the top of the hotel. It's going to cover the, you know, the Las Vegas area pretty well, but what if we need to be able to get a little bit farther out? We might need to stick another transmitter on that. What we can do is we can add in a simulcast, which allows a second transmitter to be uh, set up in the exact same manner that the first one was. And so now you've got a site uh, one and a site two, and a user can transfer back and forth between the two sites without any issues. They retain coverage, they retain talk groups, they can talk back and forth all that they want. Same thing with a scanner user. A scanner user can be up in site two and in this case be able to listen to the black or red talk group at any time. Now if you fall outside of site one or two, you're not going to be able to hear anything. But if you're within the coverage of those two sites, uh, you'll be in good shape. There is a limit with SmartNet in simulcast. You can only have 10 simulcast sites uh, per, per area or per network there. So you can only have 10 transmitters within that that are all repeating that same, that same traffic. Um, there's some different ones. I'll show you some maps of, uh, of some of the other transmitters and how they're laid out in, in our network back at our place. The key here with uh, the, the different sites is the data and the audio has to be synchronized because now I've got two transmitters sending out the exact same thing, which means if, you're, if you haven't synced up the audio very well, when you stand somewhere, you're going to get time delivery difference between the two tra uh, transmitters and you're actually going to get an echo effect. So most of these sites are all synchronized via GPS to be able to offset themselves appropriately so where their coverage overlaps, you don't get an echo. You get a perfect mix of the audio back and forth. And that is definitely a challenge uh, for the radio engineers. So next, you jump up to a smart zone. Smart zone allows you to connect multiple sites together. And these sites can be located anywhere. So in uh, a site, in this case, can contain simulcast or not. In this uh, diagram here, we've got three different sites. We've got the black site, the blue site, and the red site, uh, otherwise known as site one, site two, and site three. Um, in a smart zone system, you can have a total of 64 sites uh, all within a smart zone system. And that encompasses what will make up a zone in, in the next slide. Um, when a user is in site one, in this case, you can see site one is only broadcasting the black talk group, site two is only broadcasting the blue talk group, and site three is only broadcasting the red talk group. So as the users transition from site one out of their site into something like site three they'll head over to, when they leave that area, their radios automatically will go into a search mode and they'll search for control channels of other known sites that have been programmed in. So they'll start looking to say, hey, I'm out of coverage, where do I need to go? and they'll start to transition into that area. Once they actually arrive within an area that has coverage, their radio will, will register or authenticate or associate to that site. Now, controlling all of these different sites is what's called a zone controller. The zone controller is a central uh, basic 
database, if you will, um, that keeps track of everything. And it says, in this case, the black uh, talk group user comes over to site three, and it's going to ask the question, does this black talk group user have the rights to be on site three? That's stuff that the administrators set up and allow them to either have the rights or not have the rights. In this case, if they have the rights, it goes ahead and authenticates them. Site three will start then broadcasting out that traffic. What this means to scanner users is you might be scanning around. Let's say you live in site three. You notice site three doesn't overlap with anything else. So one day, you're just cooking along. You're listening to the red talk group. You scan around, and all of a sudden, you start hearing the black talk group. And you say, hey, what's going on? And then you're like, hey, that's cool. You call your buddy and say, hey, listen to this. And they start listening to it. Everybody starts getting in on it because it's cool stuff. Maybe it's some SWAT traffic or something like that. Um, and you're like, that's great, and that's really neat. Then the user decides to leave your area. They run off, and they register with another site. And all of a sudden, you lose that talk group. You can't hear anything anymore. So if you don't understand how this lays out and how users can authenticate and how the different sites can register uh, the different users, you might not totally understand why you can hear things sometimes and why you can't. It's also important if you've got very, uh, very overlapping coverage of sites. In our area, we have several sites that overlap with each other. And depending on which one you're listening to, you'll hear completely different traffic. It's all on the same system, but you'll hear different traffic all, all, all together. So the next step up from there is if you have these sites, remember uh, with, within a, uh, the previous one, you could have 64 sites. Um, but what if 64 isn't enough for you? Well, Motorola allows you to do what's called an OmniLink, where you can create multiple zones. And in each zone, you can have 64 sites. So that gives you a total of 192, what is it, 190, yeah, 192 sites uh, to be able to uh, run on that individual network. Same thing here, same, pro, uh, same, same setup. The user can go from site one to site three uh, in the other zone, and it automatically authenticates them, and then their traffic starts repeating. Now, at any time, an administrator can block out anybody from moving from a site to a site, so they won't register, or they can form a site to, or uh, a telesite to only or always rebroadcast a certain set of traffic. So maybe uh, site two and zone two will always rebroadcast the uh, black talk group, whether they're there or not, and then it would always send out that traffic. We have that in our area. We've got some. Um, in Salt Lake, we're surrounded by some mountains. We've got some mountain cities. And for whatever reason, their traffic is always on the Salt Lake primary system. There's no, I mean, it's, it's a 45 minute drive to get up to those cities. But for whatever reason, their traffic is repeated down into the valley for whatever reason on, on the different sites. That's a decision the administrators of the system have made and uh, kind of progress forward that way. So our system in Salt Lake, I'll talk real quick about it. It's called the UCAN system. Um, it was formed, uh, excuse me, it was a, a Motorola Smart Zone OmniLink. So it's that last slide. It's the big monster one. It was established in 1997, became operational in January of 2002, just in time for the 2002 Winter Olympics. Um, this system was a big part in the Olympics and really got funded and backed because the Olympics were, were there in Salt Lake. Um, it's currently operating with over 120 agencies on the system, and it consists of over uh, 15,300 radios. There are many different sites. Uh, we've identified up to 38 of them. And the reason why I say known sites is if you look at the numbering scheme, uh, they go up to into this like 78 range. And we've only got 38 sites that are known. So either they're planning for some spacing in there, and they don't have them yet, or um, uh, you know there's other ones out there that we haven't found yet. Uh, and many of these sites have some simulcast. Um, oh, I don't actually have the link on this one. Uh, let me just break out of this real quick, and I'll show you. So this is kind of hard to see here, but it's a map of the uh, Salt Lake area. This is the Salt Lake County uh, site within the UCAN system. And those little red pins there, there are five of them, are the transmitters that are all simulcast within that valley. Now, any one of those transmitters can easily cover the valley without a problem. But we've got five transmitters all simulcasting right there in the valley for, for that one location. Um, that means with the coverage, the signal strength, and everything is very good within that area. Um, it does introduce some challenges, but it's, uh, it's very manageable for us. And that's just one of the sites of those, of those 38. Um, they don't. They, uh, they, and that's one of the things is the question was, uh, do, do they interfere with each other? And it's because of the timing. The engineers have to work a lot on it to make sure that the timing of those, uh, so when you're standing in an individual area, you don't get that echo. Because if they don't, if they don't work with that, you're going to get two signals that come in, and it's going to cause a problem. Some of the scanners, we've had some issues with some of the scanners in the area, and we think it might be related to the simulcast. Um, because when we go to non-simulcast systems and listen to them, they're fine. So it could definitely be because of that. 
During the 2002 Winter Olympics, uh, there were 8.5 million transmissions on the radio system that averaged out to 5.5 per second. So that's a lot of radio traffic on that system. It's a very big infrastructure, um, and it's uh, set up to handle quite a big, big amount. Oh, there's this slide. I thought I had changed that from a link, so there's that. So. Okay, so this is one of the sites. Uh, this is the Clayton Peak site um, that uh, UCAN has. There's, a, a, of course, a ton of them around the area. There's five of them right in the Salt Lake County system uh, or Salt Lake County uh, uh, site. This is one of the other ones that covers a, a little bit different area. Um, we happen to have some other radio equipment that we uh, take up here on a regular basis, and so uh, this is an easy one for us to see and get close to. So, um, But they've got different sites all around. In Utah, we've got the advantages of mountaintops. Here in Las Vegas, uh, you've got some mountaintop hills and whatnot, but most of the stuff is on top of the hotels. Uh, when you look at some of the database information that we'll show you here in a minute, uh, you end up seeing uh, the, the, where some of these transmitters are at, and they're just on top of some of the hotels around. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Taylor. He's going to talk a little bit about APCO 25 and what that means to all of us and uh, scanning in the future. So, Hi. APCO 25, if I can push the right buttons. APCO 25 is an association that uh, public safety communications officials international, they make sure that everything that the manufacturers are doing is on a standard. It's an open architecture, so everybody is avail it's available to everybody, but it does bring together everybody to make sure that we're on the same page and we're all going to be able to listen and they have good interoperability between different agencies. We're all working on the same general idea. Um, their whole goal is all about public safety needs. That's all they're, all they're out there for is just the radios and public safety needs. Some of the benefits with them is improved spectrum, spectrum efficiency and it ensures that competition between vendors to make sure that they're moving forward the standard and nothing gets, is staying stagnant. So what does that mean for us? It just means that as for scanners, it means when you buy a scanner, you want to make sure that it's APCO 25 uh, they're doing all the digital uh, standards so we can all make sure that we are able to listen. Um, of all of you that own scanners, do you, how many know about rebanding that's coming up? Okay, not very many of you. I hope you'll learn something here then. Rebanding is also called reconfiguration. It refers to changes in the 800 megahertz ba uh, band plan. And it's happening right now because of Nextel. How many of you guys have Nextel? Good. <laughs> the guys who have Nextel, you're actually, when you use your walkie-talkies, you're actually on a trunk system. It's just a highly modified trunk system, and it uses the same kind of uh, what Brett just talked about. And it actually is in the uh, same as the public safety ban. So they're causing some interference, and they realized that back in the 1990s, and now everybody across the country is right in the middle of that change, and they're actually flipping the two bands. And why won't it work? Because depending on what you listen to, the three different systems Brett talked about, um, if you listen to EDAX or LTR, you'll just need to reprogram the new frequencies of the logical channels that he was talking about. There's no changes on, on those systems or conventional. If you listen to the Motorola systems that he talked about, all their programming is going to change because when you key up a radio, the talk group says to go to channel 85, channel 85 is no longer going to be the same channel it was before. So if you have a scanner that is not rebanding um, compatible or it's going to be able to get the firmware upgrades that have not been released by anybody yet, so there's, there could be a period where nobody can listen to anything on their scanners if it's a Motorola system. What Motorola is, they haven't really released what they're doing to anybody yet uh, that we could find, so they could just change their channel channelization and make no other changes to the data, just be real easy. Uh, just a firmware upgrade. They could follow the P25 system with the APCO 25. They haven't said they're going to. I hope they do. And they could use a completely new control channel uh, format specifically for rebanded systems. And they could do something else. Right now, no vendors have released anything. So when the system switches over, and uh, a lot of them are happening real quick, I'll show you a map, uh, you won't be able to listen if it's a Motorola system. Uh, I'll show you a map here, just a minute. He asked when the switch was. Um, scanners that will not work. This is not a conclusive list, but if you happen to have one of these scanners, sell it on eBay now. Hurry. 
uh, I, we can, you can grab this from our, uh, send us an email or send you this list, but you just want to make sure if you're buying scanners or if you're looking on eBay, make sure it's rebanding capable. This might be a little hard to see, um, but you can see the different colors here and they're in the different waves. They're doing it across the country in different waves. The blue uh, is the wave that's uh, being ready to change over in this end of this year, quarter four. So nobody's released a firmware yet. Nobody's tested it yet because they're not public uh, on the public system. So hopefully we'll be able to listen, but there could be a period uh, where we won't be able to. This is the timeline. Uh, you can see that the blue is in the, it's going to be done by the fourth quarter of 2007. And you can see the other there and you can grab this and reference it with the map. Then we want to talk a little bit about hardware and what that kind of means. This is one of the hardware, Radio Shack. It's a trunking, it's a Pro 97. It's a very popular, one of their most popular scanners. If you happen to have this one, that's an eBay one. Uh, the Pro 96, that's another one of their popular ones. This one is digital because there is a uh, digital and analog. Um, this one does support digital and it's going to be supported by rebanding. Most of these are just firmware upgrades. Some might be a, some of the Radio Shack ones, they're saying it might be an actual uh, change of the hardware. And there's the unit in BR330T and the BCD399 or 396T. There's the analog version and the digital version. This is what both me and Brett have and uh, we're it does support rebanding, so, and if you notice on the, it is NASCAR certified, so, are you NASCAR guys? The R stands for racing. This is an AOR version, it's um, non-trunking, conventional, great for listening to air tra uh, aircraft, public safety, if it's not on the, one of the trunking systems. And then this is one that's coming soon. Um, and no, I haven't seen it yet, but we looked it up online and there's a review in these magazines that we're gonna have, anybody can come up and grab one, it's the Popcom. And uh, it's, they were traditionally, uh, GRE was traditionally an OEM scanner uh, producer for Radio Shack. They made like the Pro 97 and those. So now they're saying they don't like the direction that everybody's going with scanners. So they're gonna start to go direct. So it's very similar to the Pro 96 because they made it. Um, and there's a full review in the Popcom magazine we have up here if you guys want to grab one. It is going, it's, it better be <laughs> if it's brand new. So we want to talk a little about finding stuff. So when you're listening, uh, I don't know how many were in the talk before, but they talked about direction finding. Uh, Uniden has a very, uh, one of their specific features and they call it close call. Um, other vendors may call it something different, I, I'm not sure. Uh, what it does, it instantly tunes to nearby signals. Um, just within a proximity, you key up and it will tune to that. It can show you their tone so you can find out who's going there. So hotel security, that's how we found them. We just stood next to them while they keyed up. <laughs> There's, uh, you can do that with police. You can do that like wireless mics. You can be driving down the freeway and you can see a cop with somebody pulled over and they're talking on their wireless mic. Just turn on close call. You can listen to the conversation. Uh, it does it with FRS and everything too. So we'll just kind of demo one that's there. I just put it in a close call and you can, I can have anybody who has a radio actually can key up and it keys up and you can listen. Check, Go ahead and check. talk. Check. Besides that guy over there. That's Sherpa Mike, by the way, he brought up all this stuff for us, so we we'll want to thank him. So close call is pretty neat. If anybody else, we'll show you afterwards. Um, There's also direction finding. Uh, you can use this to help find the signal, but then you can do transmitter hunts. So this box right here that we brought up, Brett, if you wanna open it, it's a transmitter in a box on a battery and uh, it just broadcasts a signal that we can uh, program in the different things. Uh, it's actually called a PICCON that's in there. This guy up front is where I got it from. Uh, he can probably get your information. But we, what we wanna do is next year, we want to have a competition. We'll go hide this box somewhere and uh, we'll go find it. We'll tell you what frequency it's on, but then you guys go find it and put a phone number in there and whoever finds it, come call us or however. So if you guys are interested, please, at the end of our slide, we're gonna show you our email. We want you to send us an email and uh, we'll see if we can set up that competition. We couldn't really get the Doppler system in here, kind of hard when it's on top of a car, so there's a picture. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Brett. He's gonna talk about some of the cool software that you can use and uh, 
I forgot my antenna over there. It's a good direction finding antenna. I'm not going to tell you who makes it because they didn't like me when I sent an email to them to see if they'd send me anything free. So you can talk to me afterwards, but I don't want to tell them their name. All right, so when you're trying to get started and stuff, it's sometimes a little bit difficult. And when you travel into a new area, a lot of us travel for business, and it's a little bit challenging when you go in. You maybe go to the hotel at night, and you're just sitting there watching CNN, television, whatever. Um, some of these resources allow you to kind of play around with your scanner a little bit and maybe be a little bit more successful in trying to figure out where something's going to be or who's going to be where. Um, maybe you've got a, uh, a special event going on in your area. Um, some of these resources will help you figure out what's going on and be able to track it a little bit better. The first one, and probably best online database, is radioreference.com. Uh, if you haven't been out there, I really suggest you go. Um, they, uh, it's all free, but they do take uh, nominal donations and you get a little bit a, uh, of enhanced functionality or something like that. It lets you keep track of your systems that you're monitoring and whatnot. Um, but it's a great little reference. And the cool thing is they've got uh, moderators on there that uh, you can submit changes and updates to the database so you can keep everything current. So as you go out and find new things and discover them, you can update them in the database. And then everybody uh, around gets those updates as well. Um, just the other day, I found a new control channel within one of our sites, sent that over. They posted it. And now it's there for everybody to see. So radioreference.com is a great, uh, great source there. For scanner control and recording, there's a couple uh, applications that uh, I've used. The first one listed here is Trunkstar Elite Pro. Uh, it's a commercial piece of software uh, really designed for scanning uh, or controlling multiple scanners simultaneously. So if you've got a lot of uh, base scanners at home, you know, ones that aren't handheld, uh, you can program them up with this and allow them to all be controlled centrally under one application. It gives you a nice little GUI interface and you can point and click around, but it is uh, commercial software. Scan Recorder version 1.9, I use this one fairly regularly. Um, it's simply a Vox recorder uh, for the for the scanner. So you can turn it on and program it to just start recording. So then w that way when you're listening to something, uh, if something's going on, you can go ahead and start to uh, uh, start to uh, record all those events. I was down here last night at the uh, black and white ball, and uh, we heard that there was a man with a gun out in the parking lot. And so I ran up to the room to try to get some audio for this. And by the time I got up there, it was all taken care of, and it was all OK. So I was hoping to get something good and be able to play it, but it Oh, well. Um, so scan recorder, it's basically just a Vox recorder. There's the URL where you can pick that up. Um, as far as I know, it's free. The guy, I don't know if the guy wants donations or not, but it, the download links are on his site. ID Tracker 2, I'll show you a screenshot of that. That's really cool. It uh, actually monitors the trunk system, shows you what talk groups are talking, uh, so you can see a listing of what's going on, and allows you to then record based on some of those preferences. So you can say, I only want unidentified talk groups to record, or I want all talk groups to record, or I only want this one or that one, or however you want to set it up. That's really good for if you know what's going on in the system and you're just like, well, there's nothing really to listen to, but let me see if there's something new. That way you can set this up, let it run overnight, and then tomorrow morning you look at the log and say, oh, there's all these unidentified talk groups, and you can go listen to the recording that you made overnight and try to identify exactly what that was by listening to that audio. And it's all in a condensed form, so you don't have to sit there and wait for all these long delays where there's no transmissions. You get just, just the transmissions, so just the meat of it the entire time. So take that several hours of scanning down to a few minutes, which is really nice. Very concise, but lets you uh, hone into it. Uh, trunk monitoring. I use a program called the Unitrunker. Um, I'll show you that here in a second. That actually uh, monitors the control channel, shows you what the entire system's doing, who's on what frequency, all the different talk groups and everything. I'll show you the, uh, that here in a second. And then for programming, um, you, on all the scanners, you can do it from the keypad. And there's usually some software that's contained within it. I really like the Boutel stuff. Uh, it works really well and allows you to program it. Gives you a little bit better interface. Sometimes point and click, dragging, copying, pasting. Those simple things that some of the built-in software doesn't quite have. So Boutel's a, a good software for that. It is commercial. They usually do have a demo version that lets you upload so many systems or something like that. And they make it for a whole bunch of different scanners. So the first one here was ID Tracker. Um, this is the uh, it, it up and running when I was at home. Uh, you can see the log is down below, which is uh, pretty weak on these monitors. You can't really read it too well. Um, but up at the top, it shows you what's going on right now up here up at the top. Uh, you can see the, the system I'm listening to is UCAN SLC, which is the site. The talk group that's active is 19712, which is UHP Salt Lake County. Um, it's been hit 46 times, and the current time is 2130 or 930. Uh, 
um, the hits 46 times, what that means is since I've turned on this program, it's been active 46 times. And what that tells me is that that's a fairly active talk group depending on when I turn this on. If I look down on the logs down below, um, you can see all the different things that have been listed or that I've heard during that time with all the hits being listed on the far right. If you notice second from the bottom down there, there's one talk group. It's really hard to see on the screen. Uh, it's in red. It's 12352, two, and the text next to it says unidentified. What that is is a talk group that I don't have listed in my program, and so it doesn't know what it is. And therefore, if my program was set up to record it, it could have recorded that. Now, in this setup, I've got uh, five hits on that talk group. Now, that could have just been one person saying, hey, what's going on? And somebody saying, uh, nothing. And somebody else saying, OK, well, uh, do you want to go take lunch? And he says, uh, yeah, sure. And so that really doesn't tell me anything. Uh, but if I monitor that for some time, I could pick up more and more recordings and little pieces of information might be able to stitch the entire thing together. And there's a group of us in Salt Lake that are working on the uh, uh, airport system right now and there's a talk group that we don't know what it is. We think it's something related to the baggage loading ramps, but we're not sure. They keep talking about things getting jammed, but then they talk about vehicles at the same time. So we're not exactly sure if it's just the vehicles getting the bags there or what. So there's a, several of us that are all online trying to listen into the talk group and then we post what we hear and are able to record uh, to be able to try and identify what it actually is. So the next one here is Unitrunker. Uh, let me try to bring up the uh, live shot of it here. Okay. So this is Unitrunker running right now on the, uh, oh it doesn't show. Does that show? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is Unitrunker running on the, uh, the Nevada Snack system. Um, the top section up here, which is hard to read, uh, is listing frequencies on the left-hand side of the screen, and then it starts to list the users on the next column, the actual ID of that talk group, and then the ID of the radio that's transmitting. So over here, again, you've got the frequencies, the uh, talk group, the actual talk group number, and then the ID of the radio that's transmitting. Down in the bottom section, it lets me list out all the different uh, uh, different people or the different groups that are on the system. I can scroll over and I can see if there's any patches. There aren't any current patches on the system. What that would be is if they took two talk groups and they linked them together. So they take the police and uh, the fire guys or whatever and they link those two together so everybody can talk. If that happened, you could watch that on the patches down below. Um, I can go into sites. These are all the different sites that it's advertising right now. Site 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, right now I'm listening to site 1. You can see that up at the top of the screen. You guys can't see it. I can see it. Uh, it says site one up there at the top of the screen. Um, so I know there's at least six other sites in here. All the frequencies are listed there, so now I know that. I can go program that in my scanner. The neat thing is with this, all I have to do is scan around, find a control channel, plug it into the scanner and start listening, and then all this stuff starts popping up. So it makes it really nice uh, to be able to figure out what's going on. I can go into individual users here. This is kind of neat. If you really want to get up close and personal, you can actually map the radios back to an individual user. So these are the IDs of the individual radios, the actual handhelds that uh, the people are using um, and you can see that like right here this is uh, police south command uh, and there's the actual radio ID of the person that was transmitting at that time um, you see channel one emergencies active right now um, and then these couple of 50s they've been on there this weekend and I'm not sure what's going on some sort of test um, but with the actual individual user, if you're listening to the radio traffic at the same time, you can hear who checks on. They'll say, okay, it's Delta 42 or something like that. And you can say, oh, okay, and you saw their radio ID, and then you can tie that back together and say, okay, Delta 42 is this person. Tie that in with a little bit of direction finding. You might even be able to go to the scene and identify, oh, that's officer so-and-so, and you put that in your database. So now you know Delta 42 is radio ID this, is so-and-so here, and now you've got this big map that you can build of who's where and who's what. So. Um, it allows you to be able to monitor the system fairly easily um, all through that. You can also watch affiliations. Um, affiliations are down here at the bottom. It's showing you who's associating with the system, when, and where they're associating. Um, and you can see in the far right column, a join or a leave. See, somebody just left. It was radio 25723, which means they turned their radio off, disassociated, and they're, they're out of there. So it's probably the end of their shift, and they're probably headed home. 
I would imagine it's uh, 538, so it's probably about time. Um, the neat thing here is, is that they change different frequencies. You can follow them and see them associate with a different site or a different uh, talk group and actually bounce around. The cool thing I like about this, there's several programs that work just like Unitrunker, but they require modifying the scanner so you can get a uh, uh, what's called a discriminator tap, which involves getting in, soldering to the board and this kind of thing. Um, this program really doesn't require um, as much modification. Uh, with my scanner specifically, it doesn't require any. So I'm able to do this with just by plugging into the audio. And all I've got here is just the scanner running with an audio cable plugged in and it's going in the mic line in the laptop. So it's really simple. If I take this out, it's nothing but noise. That's what a control channel sounds like. Um, and then the system's just sitting there watching it. You notice all the data went away when I did that because um, it uh, messed it up. It didn't uh, know what to do at that point. So it should probably come back here in a second. But. But that's all it is. It's just a nice little audio cable, plugs it in. It's real simple, real easy, but it helps you if you go into a new area, start to be able to track everything down and figure out exactly how that system's set up uh, and exactly how it's working. So, and that's called the Universal Trunker. And you can go here down at the bottom and, and color code things so things pop up red and get your attention if it's a, an active talk group that you want to see or you know, something to that effect. Some other neat resources that are out there, Sample Sounds, um, the, uh, the website that's listed here, it's nothing but a bunch of digital sounds because sometimes when you're scanning around you'll hear something and you're like, what is that? I don't, it's just a bunch of noise, you know, you'll hear this kind of crap and you'll have no idea what it is. So um, they've got a bunch of different sample sounds on there that let you listen and uh, verify what's going on. Um, just like the some of the frequencies, if it was maybe some type of encryption uh, or something like that, you can listen to the sample sounds and hear what that, that is known to be and uh, we can go forward from there and, uh, and see the actual uh, 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 technology or whatever is being used at that point. And then paging decoders. There are still pagers out there. People do still use them. I know a lot of people have gone off to cell phones, but pagers are still out there. Um, so you can go to this website and they actually make some software to decode the paging traffic and actually be able to monitor that. I used to work for a paging company. It was really great. You just sit in the, our little network operations center and you could watch all the pages going by. That's when the monitors or the, the pagers were very popular before cell phones were really out there and text messaging. Um, and it was great to be able to see all that stuff going by. Um, last time I checked, and I haven't checked check your laws before you do it, but last time I checked, uh, paging decoding was not illegal. It's not an encrypted signal, it's just digital, and actually decoding it, it wasn't protected like a cell phone or something like that. So you could actually listen to that without any problems, but check your local laws just in case. Stuff uh, to listen to here in Vegas and check out when you go back home. Uh, the vice frequency for uh, is, is kind of cool. Um, it's it's not trunked or anything. They're, they're kind of antiquated here. They're just running straight uh, repeaters uh, on VHF. So 155-1150. It's not always active, but it's kind of cool downtown. They'll set up little sting operations and that kind of stuff. You can listen to that. Um, it's, so it's, yeah, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. So um, <laughs> Taylor said it's an easy way to find a hooker. So um, <laughs> maybe not the ones you want to pick up though. So um, you might spend your night with a bunch of guys instead. So um, I don't know, it'll probably cost you about the same, so. Anyway, the goon frequency for last year, uh, DC-14, was 464-5125. Uh, they were running a DCS of 131. Um, do we have a goon that can maybe key up their radio? We'll do a little close call real quick and see. No? Well, we had it anyway. So this year, uh, DC-15... <laughs> DC-15, it's 464-2125 with a DCS of 131. That's their security channel. Uh, and DC-15, uh, 469-3250 with a DCS of 131 is their speaker channel for speaker coordination. Um, interesting, this year they started throwing encryption on there. So um, I think they maybe saw our talk come in and uh, said we're going to go ahead and encrypt everything. So on the security channel, it's all DES encryption. And uh, so you can just hear a bunch of static and noise. And it, it, they do talk in clear every now and then, but they kind of ruined our fun by encrypting it this year. So. And then the hotel system is an LTR system. On your CD is all the frequencies for that, the talk groups, as well as some other things uh, around here in Las Vegas, some other systems uh, with that. So you can get all that more on your CD. Stuff to hit when you maybe go back home. drive through uh, retail, these kind of things. These are all fun things to listen to. You can hear what people are ordering at Starbucks or, or McDonald's. If you were so inclined, once you have the frequency, if you had a transmitter, you could you know, possibly uh, transmit to the people in the drive through and I don't know. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. So, 
Um, businessman frequencies, otherwise known as the dot frequencies, blue dot, red dot, green dot, um, those are all associated with some type of, that was one of the goons right there. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the dot frequencies, if you search for red dot or green dot, these are standard commercial frequencies. Uh, there's usually a lot of traffic on that. FRS and GMRS, uh, that's really good for conferences like this. People bring in a lot of radios and you can uh, listen to them chat. Media remotes, this is kind of a cool one. Uh, when they're out there doing camera stuff on the side of the road, you can pick up the, the little wireless mic or uh, sometimes the links actually back to their main office. We've got a coordination frequency that's used for the helicopters and some of the remotes in Salt Lake, and that's fun to listen to. You can hear them calling to the different cameras, telling them to power up. They uh, establish their link. You tell, they tell them when to pan over and pan down and all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of fun to watch that and then watch the news at the same time, and you can kind of see the difference. And um, especially neat if there's like a high-speed chase or something on, and you're listening to that thing, and you're watching it on television, and it's, it, I don't know, it's, it's geeky, it's fun. So, um, wireless mics, uh, you can listen to traffic stops. If you didn't know that, most of the cops wear a little wireless mic now and they record all the stuff you say. Um, if you got the frequencies for those, scan through those. It's one thing to listen to the cop call out on somebody. It's a whole different deal to listen to what that person's saying back to the cop during the traffic stop. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. Um, other wireless mics, when I was in track three, I picked up a podium mic. It wasn't the main one, it was one sitting here. It was during Dark Tangent's talk yesterday and it's on 519.050. Um, and it was kind of neat if you were there, he was having some problems with his laptop and we could hear the whole conversation between him and somebody else up there um, at that time. This mic wasn't picking it up but they had something else up on the podium that was picking that up and it was on 519.050. So sometimes it's fun to just kind of scan around, listen to some of these different things. Wireless mics are everywhere. You can pick those up uh, and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're out there and they're listening. So here's a bunch of references we used as uh, we went through some different things. Uh, and here's an email address for you guys. If you have any questions, you can get back to us on here. If you need a copy of this presentation, it's a little bit different than the one that was, and it's a lot bit different than the one that was on the CD. Uh, so if you need an updated copy, shoot us an email here, dc15 at schnivik.net, S-C-H-N-I-V-I-C dot -I -I net. Um, with that, we've got uh, like five minutes. We can open it up for some questions. We do have about 200 magazines up here from Popular Communications. They were good enough to donate those to us. So feel free to come up here and grab one. Um, there's a review of that scanner. And uh, with that, uh, I guess I probably should have taken the questions before that. It's going to cause a lot of disaster. So anyway, we'll, we'll be over in the Q&A room. And uh, we'll, with that, we'll uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you. Was that?